Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue Good evening, au, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 19th edition of the Forum, the International Festival and Forum on Human Rights. Uh, this uh, discussion will be moderated by Marcel Mion, a journalist and producer of the magazine Geopolitics RTS. The space law currently in force seems incapable of responding to the major international challenges of today environmental, political, and economic challenges. We have four specialists here tonight to uh, talk about this. Uh, we have uh, Muriel Richanoka and Luca Piguet, uh, co-founders uh, and CEO of uh, the Swiss uh, startup ClearSpace. We have Benjamin Guillot, who is a, a, a lawyer and uh, a specialist in uh, space law. And uh, we uh, have uh, Christophe Bonal, who is a space debris expert uh, from the uh, CNES uh, Launcher Directory. prendre la place de la politique quand la politique est pour des raisons économiques est bloquée. It's important to be able to write about violence with the same intimacy with which I write about love. We created the kind of community that allowed us to give expression to our dignity. Black lives matter. African young people. Actually, I'm not a hero. Bonsoir à vous, bonsoir. J'aimerais commencer par Good remercier l'organisation du festival. And could I thank the organizers of the festival the pandemic, a réussi à organiser ce festival, pandemic, organize this festival. Even in this pandemic, I've organized this festival. So we'd also like to thank the technicians who are making this debate possible. And the d'aborder la question du droit des droits dans l'espace, ça peut paraître peut-être incongru dans le cadre d'un festival consacré aux droits humains, mais vous verrez que ça n'est pas tant que ça. L'espace, jusqu'en 1957, Jusqu'au um, lancement du case. premier Sputnik était um, un espace totalement vierge d'objets humains. Space, uh, Et désormais, uh, ça a beaucoup changé. C'est plus du tout le cas. But Il y a then, des milliers uh, de satellites, changed, des milliers uh, d'objets, toutes sortes there are de débris et bien d'autres choses encore uh, 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 qui tournent au-dessus de nos têtes. Um, cet espace junk, qui appartient uh, un peu à tout le monde et un peu à personne and, uh, est devenu malheureusement un peu comme notre bonne vieille terre, une poubelle encombrée uh, de toutes sortes d'objets, d'objets uh, qui menacent uh, l'utilisation uh, d'espace, voire demain, l'exploitation de ces ressources. Uh, Alors il y a bien sûr uh, toutes uh, sortes de traités, uh, de conventions uh, internationales, de traités de l'espace qui datent pour la plupart de l'époque de la guerre froide mais qui se révèlent aujourd'hui totalement inadaptés puisque um, les lancements um, des fusées des satellites uh, se sont of, uh, multipliés et notamment au cours de la dernière um, décennie on assiste à une, so common, un foisonnement uh, now, assez incroyable so uh, d'activités spatiales so much space et puis uh, il y a aussi dans l'espace uh, conséquence de cela une quantité de débris uh, toujours plus importante qui est de manière junk, exponentielle et qui um, sont condamnés même mathématiquement space, à augmenter de, de manière and, uh, exponentielle Uh, an exponential increase uh, in this debris uh, over puis, the next few years. So we really need to set some soir, clear rules. Um, imagine trying to clean up uh, space. Si on veut que uh, demain, uh, les satellites, I think nos if we want our satellites, uh, telecoms, and, uh, les satellites qui, uh, weather qui satellites in GPS in future um, to be launched, if we want our satellites, GPS technology to work, uh, if we want our smart cities to work, then we need these satellites to be agir, able to function. And in order for that to be possible, we need to protect uh, space. And uh, I'll just introduce the uh, speakers uh, very quickly. Benjamin Guillot, who uh, is in charge of uh, services contracts for the European Space Agency, uh, in terms of uh, launching rockets and satellites, and I don't think there are many experts in Switzerland uh, or indeed in Europe uh, with uh, such a specialized uh, field. Uh, Benjamin also published his uh, thesis, uh, European Space Law, 
which has become a, 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 a reference work. And he's also written about the rights of aliens. And uh, uh, it's a philosophical work. And uh, if we have time at the end of this uh, discussion, I'd really like us to uh, talk about that a little bit as well. Welcome as well to Muriel Richard Noca, who is the chief engineer of the ClearSpace project. Luc Piguet, who is the CEO uh, of ClearSpace a startup uh, that began in uh, the uh, uh, EPFL in Lausanne uh, with uh, an ambition to um, clean up uh, some space, uh, some uh, debris from space. Uh, and you are the actors for this new uh, activity, really, uh, these days. So this will be the very first time that that uh, uh, will be achieved, if you do achieve that by 2025. And we also have uh, joining us uh, Christophe Bonal, space debris expert uh, from the National Space Study Institute in Paris, who in 2016 published uh, Space Pollution, State of Emergency. And that brings me to my first question. Why is there a state of emergency? What are the dangers that we face uh, up there in space? Um, all of this debris. Thank you very much and a very good evening. And I very much regret not being able to be with you tonight. Thank you, Marcel, for your generous introduction as well. And I think uh, you've uh, touched upon a very important point, and that is that uh, space is vital for our everyday lives, GPS technology, and a whole range of other um, things which are vital now. So ensuring that uh, space operations are sustainable is absolutely vital. And yes, uh, it is under threat today because there is so much debris flying around in space. Uh, about 35,000 uh, objects of more than 10 centimeters in length. It's about the size of a fist. And then we have about 900,000 of about one centimeter. And if that collides with the satellite, then that is a tremendous amount of energy because of the speed at which they're traveling. We have 130 million um, of uh, debris of about one millimeter in length. Um, and even that uh, could uh, cause some damage. Where is that junk coming from, Christophe? Well, when you launch satellites, um, after their working life is, is complete, uh, they are just left up in space, generally. Um, and then you also have uh, the uh, rocket launchers, which uh, launch the rocket, and part of that material is left up there in space. And we also leave objects up in space. Once you launch a telescope, for example, you um, protect it with uh, a sort of shell, and then the shell that you've protected with just is left there in space. And then you also have little fragments um, of varying sizes that are linked to the explosions of satellites and uh, collisions between satellites up in space. So if I understand correctly, apart from the few satellites that come back into the atmosphere, most satellites uh, are just designed to be left up there in space and they will become junk. That's right. I think in 2020, uh, there were about 1,000 more satellites launched up in space than were recovered and came back to Earth. So what that means is that's pretty systematic, actually, um, on a yearly basis. Muriel, and uh, Muriel Richard, okay, you were chosen by the uh, European Space Agency to try to recover and destroy the very first, uh, um, uh, for the very first time, some debris up in space. Why were you chosen? Why you? Well, um, what can I reply to that? There are probably a number of reasons. We submitted a proposal, which was the outcome of about 10 years' work at uh, the EPFL, the University in Lausanne. We got the good uh, engineers together who um, came up with some 
uh, good uh, answers. So I think we're a bit lucky as well. What does the robot or vessel look like that is going to go up uh, into space and try and recover this uh, debris? What does it actually look like? Um, I think it's going to try to recover some debris, which is about 100 kilos worth of debris. Well, I don't know if we have a picture of the robot. No, we don't have a picture. So. Uh, it is on our website. It's a cube uh, about the size of a washing machine with four arms which will um, come out just before it is uh, about to capture the space debris. Um, those four arms will come out and will um, try to grab the debris. There will be sensors which will detect when the debris is close enough, and then we'll be able to close those arms around the object to ensure that uh, it is closely locked to the um, robot like uh, creature, and then it will come back to Earth. So this robot is designed then to go and capture this debris and then come back into Earth, uh, into the Earth atmosphere, and both will be destroyed. Yes, that's right, both will be destroyed. But uh, the cleaning robot um, may not necessarily be destroyed, and I think we'll touch upon that in a moment, or a bit later on. So what we're talking about is that these objects are flying around so fast, around about 28,000 kilometers an hour, um, and so your robot to grab this debris will have to be within about three meters of the debris. So this sounds like a tremendous challenge. And I'm no specialist, but I can imagine that that is extremely challenging. Trying to get a robot so close to this debris, uh, which is flying around at 28,000 uh, kilometers an hour, is not just like going to try and fill up the car with, with petrol. No, um, it's a major challenge, and there are various steps that will need to be gone through. Um, and the European Space Agency might actually say, um, look, we're not going to go ahead with this, so we're going to have to carry out uh, various uh, m stages of analysis so that there isn't a collision as well, because if our robot uh, collides with the debris, we will create even more space junk. And then once the robot is close enough to the debris, it will be flying around at about the same speed as the debris, so around about 28,000 kilometers an hour uh, in orbit around the Earth. And it will have to be within about 10 meters of the object, and then we'll open up the arms and capture it. Turning to the legal specialist now, to who does this uh, junk belong? What do you, does space law say about this? Well, there are a series of conventions, treaties, and agreements. The uh, Space Treaty, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, and the uh, 1972 Liability Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects. And these conventions state that the state that launched the satellite, or that is the owner of the satellite, is responsible for objects um, derived from that satellite that remain in space. There's no distinction between operational satellites and junk satellites. There are um, principles um, in these conventions that must be respected. So once a satellite uh, is no longer in operation, the state that launched that satellite remains responsible for the rubbish or for the junk uh, that's created by that satellite. That's right. Um, they're responsible for any damage that might be caused by that junk, and they are responsible for any damage uh, that could be caused uh, on Earth. For instance, uh, an object falling to Earth and falling on somebody's house then, uh, then the owner of that satellite would be responsible. Um, so if a, a part of a, a, an American satellite fell on my house, I could uh, uh, take NASA to court. 
Uh, that's right. Um, there are legal aspects, there are diplomatic aspects as well. You would have to ask for the, the government as well to get in touch with the US government. But um, pragmatic, being pragmatic about it, if you know who the object belongs to, then you could also go uh, to the company that built that uh, object. Obviously, though, this is very difficult because you don't know often who these objects belong to. Um, but most objects have a, a matriculation number, and therefore it's possible to trace them. Christophe Bonal, turning to you, 50 or 60 years ago, when Sputnik was launched, we didn't really think about this uh, rubbish that was going to be cluttering up space. And basically every country, everyone who was launching these satellites just did what they liked. That's right. During the Cold War, things were, of course, very difficult. Uh, you had uh, about every three days uh, something being launched uh, into space. Uh, a tremendous number of launches were taking place. And that left um, a, a mark in terms of the pollution that is left in space. There was also debris linked to those launches. There were an increasing number of satellites being launched. Many of those are active, but at one, at one point they will become no longer active, and then hopefully they will be brought back down to Earth. So from that point of view, there has been an improvement. However, what concerns us is the number of active objects flying around in space in orbit. That's right, because there are collisions. Uh, there have been collisions between satellites that have uh, led to thousands of objects of uh, debris. Isn't that right? That's right. There were, there were some famous collisions in 1951, uh, which created about 4,000 objects uh, of debris. There are about 10 collisions every year, actually, quite major collisions, which uh, generate uh, debris and waste, and uh, they can be extremely damaging. Uh, there was the Sentinel-1 satellite, for instance, where the impact was actually filmed. So this is actually quite frequent. What debris have you chosen? Luke, um, to grab in, in space. Well, we've, yes, this is by 2025. Um, this is our ambition. It's an adapter for a second satellite. It's about two meters wide, about 120 kilos worth of junk. And this is a very difficult mission. We've chosen it. Um, it's extremely complex. Uh, we didn't want an object with solar panels or something very sharp on the outside. So this is something which is quite compact, which limits the risks of a collision of generating even more waste um, as a result of this first mission. Now, if uh, also this is quite a representative object, it's quite common as a, as a type of object that you have up in space. Most satellites launched today are fairly small. And so this object is quite typical uh, in terms of the um, waste uh, in orbit uh, around the Earth for, for a commercial operation. Obviously, there is a lot of even bigger waste out there, too. Uh, but given the complexity, we wanted an object that was fairly manageable. Um, and that's why we chose this one. Muriel, we've already said it, uh, that this is a, an incredible challenge. You're a very small startup, but you're becoming bigger and bigger. You obviously are working with uh, different partners, Swiss and uh, foreign partners. What are, at this stage, uh, the major challenges? You've already explained that you need, first of all, to get close uh, to uh, the debris. And then, what are the other challenges that you need to uh, solve within four years? Yes, we're still a startup. And we're looking for talent to grow and to uh, be able to deliver on the mission uh, in time. We have chosen uh, a number of partners. We 
le soutien de huit pays. We also have the support from different uh, countries, eight uh, of them, Germany, uh, Sweden. These partners were selected uh, according to uh, their um, desires as well. And I think we are now slowly uh, getting to work with different partners that are much bigger than we are and very much experienced. Some of them already uh, are used to these kinds of missions. So more than a technical challenge, what we're learning also to become industrial. Christophe Bonal, who will be organizing this new kind of activity, uh, the cleaning up of uh, space junk? Who is going to organize that? There's one thing that uh, has not been mentioned yet, is that, first of all, you need to clean up, but you also need to uh, organize uh, servicing in space. For example, if uh, a satellite is launched on the Monday, you need to be able further on to repair it and maintain it in outer space and then bring it back. So, if uh, the clean space project works, it will open up a whole new market for companies that will have uh, the possibility to offer this kind of services. But that would have to be authorized, of course, uh, by uh, law. So what they are doing uh, at Clear Space is opening up uh, new uh, horizons and creating the technology that will be uh, used uh, over the decades to come to clean up space. Some. Uh, Demonstrations are being carried out, but this will be a real first. And who is going to pay for it? I can imagine uh, how expensive it can be to go and uh, get a recover uh, debris over there. Who is going to pay? Well, there are no uh, rules. Uh, there are only some uh, national laws, but there's no uh, pollu uh, polluter pay a principle. Uh, what we are trying to do is uh, to limit uh, debris in space uh, when you launch uh, a rocket, for example. For example, the debris that was chosen, the adapter, uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, can be found in space. If you impose uh, a polluter pay a principal, missions, uh, space missions will become even more expensive. And this would be a barrier in accessing space. So nobody has decided on that yet. So what is the cost estimate for the clear space mission? About 100 million euros for just the one piece. And most of the cost is engineering cost, and that's a one-time cost. The objective for us is to reduce uh, cost in the longer term to offer uh, space services in orbit, as Christoph was explaining. We are convinced that uh, we need to develop um, cheaper technology and operating um, uh, principles. And that's one of the big uh, challenges we're trying to deal with, uh, reducing costs. 
Do you mean that the next hunter vessel, the next mission, could be reused for different cleanup operations? It would be able to work for several debris. Yes, one, uh, this is one of the ideas. We could uh, maybe combine several operations. Of course, there are uh, different challenges. Uh, you need to be in the right uh, uh, space area, you need to find your different objectives in the same area, but this could be, for example, uh, organized in a satellite uh, constellation. So that's one of the objectives, organizing several uh, services for one servicer. And the other aspect is trying to bring technology to a uh, level of development that is uh, sufficient to reduce costs to have viable operations. And part of the work we're doing currently is precisely geared to that objective. The technology we are developing already exists today, but they're too costly for just uh, uh, offering services. You have competition, I guess. Yes, we do. Do they use the same kind of technology, a robot with arms? Christophe, uh, that's a question I'm also putting to you. Or are there other uh, technological developments for cleaning space? Yes, there is competition in that field. And there are different possibilities. Different technologies would be possible using a, a kind of fishing nets. I know the Japanese are working on this kind of idea. Yes, they do have one company. Uh, the competitors and colleagues, but we've realized that most of the um, most efficient solutions are using robot arms. What about laser technology? Why not think about laser technology? I seem to remember that in the 60s, maybe, the NASA had thought of uh, uh, using lasers to uh, uh, recover satellites and, and burn them. Yes, these uh, would be possible, but it will require very powerful uh, lasers. We have uh, met with a company working on that idea in Australia. Then uh, the idea is to um, change the trajectory of the satellite to extract it from its orbit, and it would be workable for even avoiding colli collisions, maybe, but probably not to clean up space. It's a different idea. Christophe? Are there other projects or other ideas in, in that field? This is a very uh, rich uh, subject. There are many, many starts of being created. The idea is uh, also to organize the debris hunting. There are many ideas, even uh, using ma magnetic technologies. Some of them are very clever. There are plenty of uh, ideas uh, being floated up every day. But frankly speaking, having an idea is one thing, but uh, making it uh, work is another. I think that uh, clean space uh, is uh, much more concrete. And as I was saying, I think that this initiative 
should also uh, possibly be financed later on by services offered in orbit space. This great uh, cleaning up of outer space will need to be organized at some point. As you explained that there is currently no regulation, uh, there's hardly anything uh, um, in space law, conventions and treaties. Benjamin Guyot, what sort of uh, elements would you like to see in a space law dedicated to cleaning up? Well, I would probably go back to the basis of what is already in, uh, in, in uh, space treaties, uh, that this outer space belongs to uh, the whole of humanity, that uh, no one can claim so sovereignty on the space or, uh, or on, um, celestial bodies, and that nobody can uh, use it freely. I would start by recalling those basic principles, and then there are already some principles drawn up by the UN and ISO on cleaning up debris, for example, related to the fact that rockets cannot leave more than one debris in space. And there are also junk orbits that are specifically dedicated because they are less used than other orbits. We also require what we call passivation, meaning if, um, emptying the uh, reservoirs. I'm not an engineer, but one can wonder whether there are no other elements that would be left in space even when a satellite is being brought back. It's probably very complicated from a legal point of view. There are more and more uh, actors in outer space. The Emirates have launched a, a vessel onto um, Mars. There are private actors as well. Can one imagine rules and principles applying to everyone? Yes, private states are responsible for the activities carried out, carried out by private companies on their territory. So the first point would be to uh, manage space traffic. And this is a big challenge because it's not happening today. As you mentioned, there were collisions happening. And, um, we would need to first agree on what kind of uh, danger exists, then put it into a legal text. But it's difficult to negotiate uh, uh, treaties these days. We can see that um, with climate change, for example. The fact that there are not as many actors working in space as on Earth might allow us to set some rules nowadays. Are you thinking of a big uh, uh, general assembly type? Um, this is already being discussed uh, within the UN Committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, which is a UN um, body. And uh, it's a member states and partners discussion that is happening. But then we, you would have to uh, get some kind of a consensus. Now, uh, what we are faced with is no longer the Cold War, but a uh, uh, question of um, using outer space. Christophe Bonal, how can you uh, uh, foresee rules applying to a cleaner space? 
First of all, I, there's one point I need to make. You need to understand that uh, sometimes you talk about the future, but you also talk about the past. There are many pieces of junk up there already. The only solution we have to avoid a uh, disaster is active debris removal. The other aspect is about tomorrow. We need to be cleaner tomorrow. And since 1995, with the first international negotiations, we've got uh, quite a, a, a um, well-known body of rules, but it's not being applied. There are rules, but they are not being applied. I won't go into too much detail, but uh, the U.S. government itself has got a number of rules in the field of debris, and they, uh, they were signed uh, officially by the U.S. government, but nobody is respecting it. So, saying uh, that uh, you hoping that uh, everybody is going to agree on binding principle, I'm, I don't believe it. We are working a lot on the international level on space traffic management and space traffic coordination. We're working on regulatory principles, and that is only doable with member states because of the sovereignty principle. So what we need to do is try to adopt more or less all of the same rules. And then uh, we need to coordinate everything that does not uh, impinge on state sovereignty. And that's what we call state space traffic coordination. And we're working hard on that as well to achieve a global standard. But it won't be compulsory. It will be more of a best effort. But there won't be any police either to punish those who do not respect the rules. And that's, that's the biggest difficulty indeed. We are very much interested in all of the initiatives that are being taken, but I can hardly imagine a Chinese policeman or Russian policeman uh, going uh, to impose a fine on a, a Chinese or a Russian spaceship. People make a, often make a comparison with the International Aviation Organization, but that's completely different when you've got a plane uh, that is uh, going to fly from Munich to Madrid and, and to the US. Of course, you have to have the same rules, and that, uh, uh, that's what it worked. But I truly believe that although we're working hard and we have different working groups working on it, but and clear space, do you need rules to start uh, thinking about your next mission, or can you just uh, act within the current framework? Well, of course, we think that we can already act in, within the current framework. Our uh, view is a fairly simple one, and that is we need to uh, cut out excuses. 
Um, of course, uh, it's one thing saying what needs to be done, uh, but uh, I think we need to just cut out the excuses. There are a lot of excuses for doing nothing. And uh, some countries just say, well, the um, uh, waste up there wasn't launched by our government, but the previous government. And so it's not up to us to clean it up. And there are a lot of other excuses out there. So I think uh, what we need to focus on are solutions and viable solutions. And in the international treaties, we can see that states are uh, responsible for, uh, for um, mistakes that they have made. And it's very difficult to identify those mistakes in space um, when you have uh, satellites and constellations. I have a, a one-web satellite which broken down and which uh, collides with uh, a different satellite and creates a lot of waste, for instance. Now, even if I say that OneWeb is responsible for that, um, or the UK government is responsible for that, they will come along with thousands of documents to show that they did everything they could to ensure that uh, no, that all of the risks were eliminated. They um, launched it with uh, Ariane, who was extremely uh, responsible. They had the best engineers in the world, and it just broke down. And uh, 10 people uh, tried to recover it, and uh, no one else could have done better. And so it wasn't their fault. Um, so you can imagine that as an example. Um, if I buy uh, a Mercedes, it never breaks down, and then it just breaks down um, on the motorway one day, and I try and repair it because I'm sort of engineer, I can't repair it, and I just leave it there, and I go off and buy another car and just leave it there on the motorway, I have a uh, committed a fault, a, a fault, a mistake. I am responsible for that. That's on Earth rather than in space. So if you just leave a satellite that's broken down uh, up in space, is that your fault? Is that your responsibility? That's what we need to be focusing on. And we think we just need to look at the solutions. What are the solutions? Well, we can't just um, leave things as they are. We need change. And there are a lot of discussions about rules and regulations, but that's going to be very difficult to agree on at international level. It takes about 15 years to uh, agree on a convention and uh, um, we believe that probably the most important uh, change that can be made is with the licenses uh, provided issued by uh, the uh, launching states um, because the state is responsible for launching and therefore issues the licenses and so you expect that the companies behind those launches are also responsible. Um, and I think we need to see these regulatory changes. But uh, sometimes people say, well, there are no uh, tow-away trucks for uh, waste in space. Um, so that's the problem we have. We just cannot, we cannot re recover that waste. So that's why we think our project makes sense. And we think that if we are successful, then this will have a transformative impact on the space industry. We are convinced of that. But imagine the principle of uh, the polluter pays uh, transposed to space. Is that going to happen uh, in the near future? No, not in the near future. But what Luke says is right. You need to uh, impose rules on launchers and on companies that are launching satellites, um, because that is how you will force polluters to pay uh, and to recover their own junk. But competition in space is very difficult. Constraints tend to penalize um, most operators, so nobody wants to impose constraints or be the first to do so. But once space exploration is so dangerous because there is so much junk, then space will be forced to act and they will be forced to adopt new laws and regulations. It's a question of this relationship between the cost, um, which will rise and rise because of the amount of waste up in space, um, and the need to take action as a result. Can you imagine a situation whereby the rules 
governing space are similar to the rules governing the Antarctic. Well, very often you cover, you, you compare the space law to the law of the sea, because uh, it's true that the states have managed to agree on uh, rules for um, the high seas and for the Antarctic, uh, which are uh, areas that don't come under any national sovereignty. But space is very different. Space is infinite. Um, it uh, uh, is actually um, overarching. It's uh, overall every territory, uh, in fact. Uh, the Antarctic, we don't really use very much, whereas uh, we have an intensive use of space, and that's increasingly intensive use of space, actually. As Christoph says, we uh, increasingly need um, uh, space. Could we imagine a situation where Geneva, which uh, is the host uh, city of many international organizations, including um, the Geneva Conventions, the International Telecommunications Union, and others, could Geneva then become the center of uh, space regulation? Uh, for this issue of waste. Well, of course, uh, the UN would love to be the leader in this area, and uh, it would be legitimate. And uh, you also have the International Telecommunications Union, of course, in Geneva, which um, divides up uh, frequencies uh, and also has uh, uh, operations in uh, uh, regulatory uh, activity in space. Um, and it would be uh, legitimate. Of course, Geneva has a role to play. Geneva is in Switzerland, and Switzerland is neutral, and that's a very important aspect if you talk about space. Christophe Bonal, do you agree with that? You're in Paris. Um, do you think Geneva is the, the, the global regulatory center? Well, first of all, I'm just not competent to uh, speak on this issue. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and what you should remember is that um, in orbit, you have Americans, Russians, Chinese, um, basically. 95% uh, of the activity in space is uh, by those three nations. And if I want to be, if, if I want to say, well, I want to regulate um, as Switzerland, and, and you say, I want to regulate these major powers, then I think that's going to be difficult. Um, in space traffic management, I would say that it would be more logical to ask Vienna uh, to become involved rather than Geneva. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think we're talking about a regular UN convention. We're talking about space. And so you need to have experts who really know about space. Um, to be responsible for the cleanup of space. And I think those who are polluting should also be very much involved in the cleaning up. I don't think there is an international regulatory agency um, who can do that. And I think it will be coordination among national regulators. And just one last thing. We talked a little bit about um, the fact that it takes 15 years to conclude a treaty. But the Piguet constellation will be launched within three years. So in 15 years' time, that will be too late. So this um, is something we need to be taking action on now, um, even just little by little. Uh, we're not going to have a, one single uh, overarching convention, perhaps, but we need to um, explain, um, for instance, to actors, uh, some technical experts that would, that would help if satellites were lower altitude, for example, because then they would come back into the Earth's atmosphere and they would be destroyed. Is that right? That's right. If you launch a satellite at a very low altitude, then when it f breaks down, then within five years, it will come back into the Earth's atmosphere and probably burn up. Um, but if you launch a satellite so um, high, then it will be uh, in orbit for 2,000 years. So um, those are the choices that need to be made. Um, and rules need to take those aspects into account. So it is possible to uh, 
launch a satellite at a lower altitude. It has been done in the past. And uh, I think that is how we're going to be successful. Well, at this stage in the debate, I'd like just to touch upon the issue of Mars. I was struck by the quality of the pictures we saw from the American robot Perseverance uh, from Mars, and uh, we even heard the wind uh, whistling around on Mars. And one of the aims of this mission was to look for signs of life on Mars. Benjamin Goyot uh, recently published, as I mentioned earlier, a book on um, alien law uh, or the rights of aliens. And so you believe in aliens, is that right? Well, uh, no, I was talking about life in space um, generally, and I think most scientists today believe that there is life somewhere in space. Um, and I think this is something people have thought for many thousands of years now. But of course, there are various types of life. Uh, it could be bacteria. Um, and uh, what is life from a legal perspective if we discovered it in space? And that's an interesting question from a legal point of view. So obviously, um, uh, rights, uh, we are humans, we have rights here on Earth. And thinking about aliens having rights is something that's very difficult for us. But it's an interesting exercise because it forces you to um, think carefully about what aliens might look like and what kind of rights uh, they would have. I think it's a question that was worth asking because of uh, colonization, massacres, um, which took place because we weren't thinking uh, from, uh, about the other. And we weren't, so you're thinking about uh, the conquest of Latin America, for example. That's right. I think we should think about these questions in advance uh, and think through the philosophy before the encounter happens. What kind of rights are we prepared to grant to aliens if we did find aliens in space? So even if uh, we met uh, living beings that didn't really have a conscience like we do, uh, what kind of rights might they have? Now, space law states that uh, we should not pollute space with uh, objects from Earth. But space law doesn't address the issue of what should be protected in space. Thank you. Thank you very much for this first part of our debate. We will now hear some questions, and we've received some questions on the chat. So I'll take them in order. Cedric says, uh, should we imagine a tax for the use of space that would enable us to finance clean cleanup operations? And could there be international cooperation for cleaning up space? Who wants to reply to that question? <laughs> This is a very well-known subject that we've worked on a lot, and here the polluter pays principle does apply. So if you don't respect international regulations, then you introduce a tax, and well, uh, you can be refunded the tax if you do respect the rules. And you might even get some extra bonus back as a sort of incentive to respect the rules. Um, but the issue is, who is the police? What, what organization would enforce such a tax? And could you go and see the Chinese military and say, pay your tax? And uh, that might well not work. So the other principle that might work is insurance. You can increase insurance premiums before the launch, and if the launch takes place uh, correctly, in accordance with the rules, then uh, there can be some money back. Um, but at the moment, 
um, there is very little insurance of this type, so that, 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 that's not really something that, that we're looking at. Catherine asks if conflicts in space develop like conflicts on Earth, how would we ensure that uh, one state's objective is everybody's objective? How to have an international consensus about cleaning up space? about having a cleaner, uh, accessible space? Well, I don't think it's a legal question. I think it's a real practical one. There isn't a consensus today, but uh, there is a consensus that's emerging about environmental protection on Earth, and that is that we can see the damage to our planet, and therefore we have to take action. And by seeing the damage, uh, we realize uh, what needs to be done. And uh, it's very difficult to see the damage taking place in space, but um, um, we need to have rules and we need to have an enforcement agency. I'm fairly pessimistic, actually, about this. Only technical constraints, binding rules, will be effective, but there may also be technical solutions, such as that proposed by ClearSpace, if that was effective and affordable. And then Juliette, which is a philosophical question, why is cleaning up space um, so easy? Um, because if you listen to Muriel, then uh, it sounds like it's quite easy. You set up a hunter robot and you grab the waste. It sounds easy. Why does it sound so easy um, if um, the cleanup operations are actually so difficult? Now, who wants to reply to that? Is it easy, Muriel? Well, it depends on your perspective. I think it's a question of uh, countries coming to an understanding. And I think at some point they're going to have to um, reach an agreement. Of course, space activity is very far from everyone's everyday lives, and this can also be an opportunity to um, demonstrate by example and what should be done, and that's what motivates me really, because I've discussed uh, this a lot with uh, operators. And I think what needs to be done is to have a consensus that will gradually grow and hopefully uh, will be effective. And that could become an example for other uh, more earthly uh, preoccupations. Yes, showing uh, the example up in space. And now I think this is the last but a major question nevertheless. What are the geopolitical um, challenges behind cleanup of space? What are the geopolitical stakes? And are they different to those that we currently see in the space race, for example? Well, I think we could all say something about that. No one really knows what lies behind many of these space operations because it's always political and it's always strategic. Of course, there are very important stakes. Access to space for all is what's important to me. I think space needs to be accessible. If it's not accessible to all, it's only limited to those who can uh, bring satellites back to orbit, then um, we're going to stop a lot of states getting access to space. These states probably need uh, satellites to uh, for, for many of their operations. That's why. And, of course, it's difficult to um, control military satellites that we don't even know of uh, uh, and launch launchers who are doing so in secret. Um, enforcing uh, these rules up in space is extremely difficult, and that's why we need total transparency. Space operations are very closely linked to military operations, except for the European Space Agency, which is only involved in peaceful operations. But there will always be geopolitical considerations. 
Um, Christophe Bonnel, your last comment on this? Are there hidden geopolitical considerations behind the clean-up space? And are they different to the major geopolitical considerations that we already see uh, in space? And even private actors are involved now uh, in space operations. I believe there's another aspect that we have not mentioned yet. Yes, but very quickly, because we're getting to the end. Most of the objects are fairly small, and it's linked to what we call space traffic. Telescopes, radars, to try and observe celestial bodies and this, uh, these essentially comes from the US so it would be a priority to uh, try and in Europe organize uh, the same kind of catalog and uh, regain our sovereignty and that for me would be uh, the major geopolitical priority and thanks to the European Space Agency and to this uh, first ever experiment in 2025 I believe that Europe could very well become a leader in uh, cleaning up space that my uh, that's my last question to you you Luc. Yes, I believe uh, we have this potential. Coming back to the political, geopolitical aspect, uh, one year ago I was in a conference uh, under Trump administration in the US uh, in the middle of the uh, crisis with China. and. Uh, a, somebody from the Space Force was uh, doing a presentation and somebody asked a question, uh, how could the U.S. Uh, work with China in space issues? And he immediately replied that they could be collaborating on uh, space debris issues. And that's very interesting because we all um, together in this. And most actors, I believe, realize that uh, common solutions will have to be found. Now, how fast, that is another issue. Yes, it's very similar to climate change. We have, we're in this together, we'll have to find common solutions as well. Yes, the space debris can be just as dangerous for a Chinese satellite as it can be for a US satellite. One of the biggest challenges would be to uh, have all of these people uh, coming together to uh, um, find common solutions. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best for this uh, big challenge in 2025. Thank you, uh, Christophe Bonal in Paris. Thank you, Benjamin Guyot. I found this discussion and debate fascinating. Uh, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. A big thank you once again to the festival, the management and technical team. Thank you very much.